Let's continue to look at this fixed membrane receptor mechanism. Again, where the hormone is the first messenger, it goes through, triggers a cascade of events to create a second messenger, which we call amplification because there's always more second messenger than first messenger. And our outcome, as far as the fixed membrane receptors, is either to activate enzymes, turn them on so they can you know, lower the energy of activation and put things together, break things apart or rearrange things, which is what's happening in almost every chemical reaction in the body. Or it is opening up ion channels because we know the flow of ions across cells uh, is important in so many physiological activities, whether it's depolarizing or repolarizing something or using the ion to trigger an event inside the cell. So, uh, so again, the hormones are activating enzymes, deactivating enzymes, or opening up ion channels for the entry or the exit of ions. Now, the next thing we want to look at is kind of the, a similar topic to what we talked about last semester when we talked about neurotransmitters. Remember, we said that neurotransmitters could be both excitatory or inhibitory. What really mattered was the receptor, which kind of helped decide if they were excitatory or inhibitory. So let's look at some examples down here of how the same neurotransmitter can either activate or inhibit or, or you know, do a different activity. Okay, now notice in this, in this picture, if we looked at an example of epinephrine and, or, and norepinephrine, and, and by the way, we know that those can also be neurotransmitters, so uh, they would certainly be hormones if they were released into the bloodstream but they can also be neurotransmitters because they can be released at a synapse. But in this case, we're talking about hormones, so we're looking at them from the perspective of being uh, hormones. Now, notice if, if, if epinephrine or norepinephrine goes to a beta receptor, then it's going to activate enzymes. If the epinephrine or norepinephrine went to an alpha-2 receptor, then the alpha-2 receptor would trigger a different sequence of events inside the cell. And in this case, it would lead to uh, reduced enzyme activity because it would lead to the, the cyclic AMP would actually reduce, uh, would, would be reduced by something called phosphodiesterase. Okay, and so, but the bottom line is it would actually lead to the reduced enzyme activity. Now, if, if epinephrine and norepinephrine went to an alpha-1 receptor, then notice the main job that it would be doing would be actually causing the entrance of calcium and then the calcium actually being used to activate enzymes. So the point on this, without trying to memorize every chemical step, is to understand that the same hormone can do different jobs according to the type of receptor that it binds with. Okay, now, uh, again looking at some of the different things that would activate enzymes. Calcitonin would activate enzymes. Parathyroid hormone would activate enzymes. Antidiuretic hormone, ACTH, FSH. These would all activate enzymes, along with glucagon activating enzymes. To, to basically reduce enzymes, though, activity, then the epinephrine and norepinephrine uh, would be used to go to uh, the alpha-2 receptors. Now, examples of things that would actually cause uh, ion flow would be several of the eicosanoids, which the eicosanoids is kind of the exception to this because the eicosanoids are lipid derivatives. Normally, we think of a lipid as being something that can go through the phospholipid, but the eicosanoid is actually a lipid derivative that does bind to the actual um, fixed membrane receptor mechanism. So it's kind of our exception to the overall rule. Okay, our regulatory hormones would do this. Our oxytocin and and uh, would also lead to the opening of ion channels and then that would eventually lead to the activation of enzymes. So again, our fixed receptor mechanism are catecholamines. You know, that'd be epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Our peptide hormones are our biggest list of hormones. And then here's our exception to the rule, our eicosanoids, because they are lipid derivatives. But nonetheless, they do bind to the receptor in the membrane. And then all of these would be considered the first 
messenger and then they would trigger a second messenger system where the second messenger is amplified. Okay, now let's look at this, the next receptor mechanism that we kind of introduced but we didn't talk a lot about. This would be our mobile receptor mechanism and our different types of hormones that are used as mobile receptor are the steroid hormones and that makes sense because they're lipid derivatives so they can cross the cell membrane. But the kind of the exception to this is the thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of compare these two. And of course, what they're going to do, whereas we said the job of these were to activate or inactivate uh, our enzymes or open up our ion channels, the main thing that our mobile receptor mechanism hormones are going to do is they're going to trigger transcription and translation, or in other words, they're going to trigger protein synthesis, the making of proteins. Now notice we have two different examples of, of mobile receptor mechanisms where the hormone, in this case it's a steroid hormone, steroid hormones are cholesterol-based, we can see our cholesterol backbone here, they literally have the ability to to just diffuse through that phospholipid bilayer membrane and attach to the receptor that's in the cytoplasm. Now, thyroid hormones, T3 or T4, they don't have the ability to go straight through that membrane. So there is some sort of mechanism that does bring them across the membrane, but nonetheless, it's not a fixed membrane receptor. There's a mechanism that brings them across the membrane and then the fixed me receptor mechanism uh, basically does two things if it's thyroid. Now, one of the main things that thyroid hormones T3 and T4 do for us is they increase our ATP production. They help us burn our energy faster, and that gives us our target cell response, the overall utilization of energy. We do it faster. And so, of course, since we're making ATP, then we know that the mitochondria has to be involved. So we see here that they actually can bind to receptors that are on the mitochondria to to uh, increase our ATP production. But the other thing that both of these have in common is they do activate genes in our DNA and they actually go to something called a hormone responsive element and it's HRE. They bind to that element. They trigger gene activation. Know that, notice that both of these kind of have common steps, step three and step four. And step five, because gene activation means we're going to do transcription and translation. Transcription, remember, being done in the nucleus uh, where we're forming our messenger RNA by reading the DNA. Of course, messenger RNA leaving a nuclear pore, going to a ribosome, and then that's where translation takes place, where transfer RNA brings in this. And of course, I've I've kind of brought back this information here where again we do see the messenger RNA that was formed from reading the DNA and uh, we see that uh, our transfer RNA comes and brings our amino acid uh, to the ribosome so our anticodon can read our codon from our messenger RNA anticodon being from the transfer RNA and then us bringing the amino acids placing them in order of course we talked a lot about this last semester so that's why I'm not going to go into much detail but what are we doing here well we are building a protein or at least a polypeptide at this point okay so what was it that triggered this to occur well it was our messenger it was our chemical signaler going into the DNA and our our receptor basically bringing it inside and going to the hormone responsive element and unlocking the specific gene for the specific protein that we wanted to build. So again, we see that we're going to build the protein. Now we might be building an enzyme because we might be building the enzyme that we need to, you know, uh, create the correct cell response, or we might be building something like, uh, you know, some sort of, some sort of protein chemical structural element like actin or myosin or tropomyosin, uh, remember how our muscles use, have to use testosterone to actually build the, the actual myofilaments of the muscle. Okay, so again, our big topic here is understanding our, our uh, mobile receptor mechanism and the outcome of it.
is to literally build a protein, whether that be a structural protein or an enzyme itself. Okay, our next topic is controlling those in, that endocrine activity by endocrine reflexes. In other words, what's causing the hormone to be released? What are the reflexes that cause the hormone to be released? And we basically can break it down into three major areas. We either have humoral stimuli. We learn that humoral means body fluid, some sort of change in the composition of our extracellular fluid, okay, or hormonal stimulation. We know that one hormone can trigger the release of another hormone. Most of the hormones from our anterior pituitary trigger the release of, of another hormone from a different area. And we know that neural stimulation can also cause a, a neuroglandular junction uh, or, or, a, or a gland to release its hormones. Okay, now let's look at, at some examples of these three things. Okay, one of the main jobs of the hypothalamus is to actually it, it is to actually take samples of our body fluids, that humoral stimuli. You know, one of the main things, one of the jobs it's doing is testing the osmolarity of the body fluids. Because if we have a high osmolarity, we're probably somewhat dehydrated. Therefore, we want to produce antidiuretic hormone. And of course, antidiuretic hormone is produced in the hypothalamus, released to the posterior pituitary, where it then uh, goes to the into the blood at the posterior pituitary. So we're definitely checking, you know, uh, we're doing a lot of negative feedback loops in the hypothalamus. So for instance, if we have a lot of, you know, one of the anterior pituitaries being produced or, or the outcome of the anterior pituitary being produced, let's say we have a lot of growth hormone that was produced from the anterior pituitary. So by the time it circulates through our body, and, and gets back to the, you know, the blood uh, brings it back up to the brain area. Now we get a sampling of that in the hypothalamus. Well, if we have a lot of growth hormone, then we're going to release a regulatory hormone that tells us not to build so much of it. If we had low growth hormone, we'd get a regulatory hormone that'd say, well, hey, start, re start producing more of it. So here we're getting humoral or body fluid information to tell us whether to make a hormone or not. Now, the next thing we can see here in this picture is we can we can literally see that, for instance, the anterior pituitary gland can actually release hormones that go to other parts of the body. So, for instance, adrenocorticotropic hormone is going to go to the adrenal cortex of the adrenal gland and trigger it to release, uh, you know, either T3 or T4. That's an example of that. So one of the major ways that hormones are released and even, even the regulatory hormones that are released from here are released to tell this to build more hormones. So, so hormones are often released when other hormones such as regulatory hormones go to them. And in this case, if adrenocorticotropic hormone went to the adrenal cortex, then it would trigger it to be released. So we had body fluid changes. And another good example of that, if we, let's say, have a body fluid change, let's say in our pancreas, uh, if we get a high glucose monitoring in our body fluids, then we're going to start releasing more insulin. If we get a low glucose glucose monitoring, then we're going to start releasing more glucagon. All right. So, so again, body fluids, uh, monitoring the body fluids help us do this. The signaling from another hormone helps us do this. And last and certainly not least, and here we see a great example of the adrenal medulla releasing adrenaline, which would be epinephrine, norepinephrine, once it is stimulated from neurons coming, in this case, directly from our hypothalamus. Remember, our sympathetic nervous system is going to trigger you know, by releasing its own hormones here or its own neurotransmitter, then it's going to trigger the hormones to be released to get us through the emergency. So again, we see in this picture the three examples of how hormones are signaled to be released. Humoral, the composition of our extracellular fluid. Hormonal, the arrival of a hormone to trigger the release of another hormone. Or neural stimulation, having direct direct neural stimulate cells that then cause them to release hormones.